We have found the point here from Every Child Matters, and I'm just gonna use this note here. Um, Every Child Matters is a their nonpartisan organization, and basically the way I understand it is they they make children's issues affecting children um, a priority in the in the caucuses and the primaries in the future election. And so I'm here just to kind of talk to us about um, what we can do, right, at, and and what what exactly the organization stands for and how we can talk to the community. Good, so that's a great a, introduction. I was just doing a caucus training with three other people down in Des Moines, uh, and uh, literally at 7.17, I jumped in my car and I drove up here. Um, and I really welcome this opportunity. I work for a nonpartisan organization, and uh, we promote kids' issues in elections. The history of our organization is pretty simple. Um, um, back in 2000, uh, 2001, uh, we had an opportunity, this fellow that I worked for back in uh, Maine, he was working for an organization in Washington and he left his job. And someone came and says, you know, would you take a look at how the world of children's advocacy and issues around kids, whether it's early childhood education, which some of you are enrolled in undergraduate program in that area, uh, the whole issue of child abuse and neglect and the, the child welfare system plays out, um, the whole sort of a need for, uh, particularly in a place like Iowa, a state like Iowa, where the demographic is uh, the, the percentage of two parents uh, two-parent households, both parents working, with kids in a certain age cohort is, I think it's uh, uh, six or under, uh, is, uh, is so high, it's like, if, in terms of the census data, it's number one and number two, depending on what particular time of day or when they take the census down. There's tremendous work ethic here, and folks are trying to make ends meet, and if they have kids, uh, they don't have a program to for their kids to go to uh, after school when they get home at 2.30. And that window of time from three to six is, is a time where kids who are unsupervised, sometimes uh, things go awry and uh, they get in trouble. Uh, the whole issue of child health, some of you may have been following the debate in Washington, which is an ongoing debate as to whether or not, uh, what level and what type of uh, programmatic uh, standard should be built into the state children's health insurance program. Uh, all of these issues, uh, the amount of kids whose parents are in jail, when the, uh, an adult gets into a correctional facility, it's a reflection of a failed social policy, and there's a tremendous amount of meth uh, in this state, uh, and in spite of all of our best efforts to control it, one of the things that's really lacking is uh, treatment, and uh, adequate resources for treatment for parents with kids who are in jail as a result of meth, they're, they're being incarcerated, but they're not getting any kind of treatment to deal with their, their uh, drug-induced problem. So there's a whole array of kinds of issues that we kind of focus on. But when, back in 2001, someone came to us and said, well, who's out there sort of focusing on these issues during elections? Every state, uh, I'm from Maine, that's why I talk funny, uh, I have a little bit of a New England twang, uh, but um, every state has a legislature. Uh, back in the 70s, uh, I served in the Maine legislature. Uh, every state has a legislature, and there are always people who are promoting issues while the legislature's in session, whether it's here in Iowa, down at the State House in Des Moines, or whether it's in my home state of Maine, at the Capitol in Augusta. And there's a group of people who are always promoting issues at the nation's capital on behalf of any number of uh, issues, but in, in terms of the kids, is it? There's a, there's a good group of people who are, well, uh, they, they do their research and uh, they have uh, impact and talk to people like Senator Dodd, who was here just a few moments ago, uh, on kids' issues, whether it's Head Start or Child Health or any of the issues that we just touched upon. But one of the things that we discovered that was missing uh, in terms of this kind of activity was nobody was really focusing on kids' issues during elections. You have groups that had political action committees for pro-life or pro-choice or pro-gun or anti-gun, 
for insurance companies and that sort of thing. But there was no real sort of focused activity uh, except for these sort of helter skelter uh, bits and pieces of activity taking place, more kind of a focused activity on kids' issues. So we cut our teeth uh, in, a, in, a, in Arkansas in 2002 uh, in, a, in a Senate race using our nonpartisan educational kind of activity, trying to give people tools that they could go out and talk to the candidates about kids' issues. We did some work out here in the, uh, this quadrennial exercise we call the I Iowa Caucus. We did some work in the 2003-2004 cycle where we were trying to take people who worked in the children's community, anyone who was going to be involved with kids, we were trying to give them some sense of empowerment that they can talk to candidates and they can make things happen. And uh, we did some work in West Virginia. I was in Charleston, West Virginia. And 04, and then in 05, I was in Richmond, Virginia. We were involved in a gubernatorial race down there, promoting our kids' issues in a nonpartisan educational way. And the, way, the reason we're able to do this is there's a special mechanism in the federal uh, IRS code where nonprofit uh, non organizations can engage in nonpartisan activity. They, they can engage in educational activity around any number of issues. And that's where, that's the niche that we're filling in terms of kids' issues. So we're delighted to have an opportunity to talk to two people, three people, four, five people, uh, seasoned players in the caucus process like I've had down in Des Moines a, a, an hour ago uh, before I dashed up here. Uh, on the way in, I, I, I was kind of delayed because I, I didn't know that Senator Dodd was going to be here. He did a forum uh, with our organization up in New Hampshire. Uh, the University of uh, uh, New Hampshire in Durham. Uh, and he is a tremendous children's advocate in terms of his legislative policy. I was telling Stephanie, I first met him uh, in the summer of 1983. Where were some of you in 1983? Right? <laughs> uh, I, was, I was a political advocate then uh, on behalf of kids uh, up in Maine, and uh, Senator Dodd had come to a, a meeting that, uh, that was uh, associated with the National Governors Association. It was a summer meeting of the National Governors Association in Portland, Maine. And he came in and flew, flew in from D.C. and he spoke to a group of children's advocates. So anytime I see him, I say, well, the first time I met you was up in Maine, Portland, Maine, in the summer of 1983. And I thank him for doing this, this, this forum up in, up in New Hampshire on, on, uh, on behalf of kids. And uh, that's one of the things that we're trying to do. We're, we're working with the Edwards campaign do a forum in Des Moines on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. And we have requests out to all the candidates that we will provide them an opportunity to come in and uh, answer six prepared questions. We have to have all the questions prepared in advance and we have to give them to all the candidates because we're a nonpartisan educational organization. We can't show any favor to anybody. And uh, we're going to be doing hopefully this, this uh, similar sort of forum with the from Senator Edwards in, in, uh, in Des Moines on, on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. So, what can you do in terms of mobilizing people around kids' issues? Now, my sense is this group over here is the early childhood undergraduate section, right? Somewhere through here, all right? And there's some other people here. What, what's the other? There are two other groups. Um, or one other group? I was the patient for education for children. We have um, That's your allied, group. Yeah, we have allied and UCDs. Um, there's some faculty and staff with us, um, and also we're the University Child Care Committee. I bet is there anybody here from that organization? Here we okay. go. All right. And um, the HDFS Club. And that is the Human Development and Family Studies program okay. here. So you're there. all sort of working in a undergraduate studies that will get you involved in working in children and families issues uh, uh, after you graduate, or you can go on to graduate school. Well, I mean, the basic, I mean, uh, when I came in and I saw Senator Dodd there, and you know, Stephanie told me he was here, and, and uh, little did I know he was long enough to crowd for me. I mean, he could come in here and do his workshop on kids. I mean, he knows all this stuff upside down. He was the head of the Senate Children's Caucus uh, in, uh, back in the 80s, and he's, he's devoted a good part of his uh, legislative career to kids' issues. He's a perfect example and I'm saying this in a nonpartisan way, of a senior senator uh, uh, over the years who has really established 
track record like this. Um, and uh, uh, he, uh, he, he, uh, he's done a great job on, on, on many of these programs. As I said, I was delighted to have an opportunity to just thank him for doing what he did up in New Hampshire. Um, so I'm not exactly sure you know, where do you want me to go with this. Um, it is getting late in the day, and you've had a great opportunity to talk to Senator Senator Dodd. How many other? How many of you have been talking to sen uh, presidential candidates? All right. So, um, what I've discovered, and I always tell groups, uh, in terms of what I'm focused on with kids' issues, whether it's early childhood education or the other list of issues that I'm talking about, is that you have in Iowa, and I'm from Maine, it's a caucus state, you have a tremendous opportunity to meet the next president of the United States. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't let it pass. But if that means, uh, now you've talked, you had a chance to talk to Senator Dodd, and uh, how many others have you talked to? How many others have you invited here? You sh you know, this calendar is down to, I think, 37 days, and the clock is running, tomorrow's 36. Any opportunity you have to talk to them about kids' issues. Well, some of the materials that I have here, we have this really slick, glossy brochure that we put together, a nice covered stock. Um, Homeland insecurity, why children must be a priority in the 2008 presidential election. One of the things that has fascinated me over the course of the last several months, and I've been through uh, several of these quadrennial exercises going back to 1972 um, is that there's always a topical issue or several topical issues that's always on every pe people's minds. Always on people's minds. Uh, the war in Iraq, um, the economy, uh, and the whole question of universal health insurance or providing some sort of health insurance for people, particularly the millions who are uninsured. It, it seems like those three issues in some sort of rotation, depending on which day the pollsters take their, their snapshot using their polling instruments, that are dominant. But what we find is one of the things that our organization does is we do a lot of polling. And if you go to our website, everytownmatters.org, and there's going to be material over there that has all this information on it in terms of where you can go. One of the things that we discover when we poll is there is a deep, deep reservoir of support for children's issues on the Republican side of the aisle and the Democratic side of the aisle. The numbers are staggering in terms of the percent. The question is, how does that ultimately get shaped in, into public policy through the legislative process or through a presidential election or even a local legislative election? And that's where you folks have to come into play. The other thing that we've discovered with our polling, and all of this material is archived on our website, is that most people who participate in elections really don't have a good idea where candidates stand on children's issues. Uh, I've been involved, as I say, in a number of elections locally. I ran for the legislature and that sort of thing. It's usually those three or four issues at the top that dominate. So how does, how does an issue around children, where there's a deep reservoir of support, how does it usually get measured in a campaign? Usually it's measured in a campaign where a candidate gets his picture taken with a baby, holding a baby, uh, you know, bending over to a child. But how does it get sort of measured in terms of clients in their platform or their position papers on, on these issues? So that's one of the things that we try to do with our organization is we try to draw out the candidates in terms of where they are. We're, we're working with another organization here in, in Iowa, uh, Every Child Counts, the Child and Family Policy Center. Uh, Charlie Bruno, who's from Ames, runs a small uh, nationally recognized think tank policy form group that impacts Iowa and also national policy on early childhood education and other matters. Uh, uh, they have put together from being 22 groups which we are one, where we have actually sent out a questionnaire to the candidates on issues around children and family, early childhood education, after school care, improvements in the child welfare system, immigration reform, uh, uh, economic security issues. 
And what we did is we, we worked together, and this, these questionnaires were sent to the candidates, and now they're all back. Some of them said, well, we don't do surveys. Uh, that was one presidential candidate. Another presidential candidate said, we generally don't do surveys, which means they pick and choose. Uh, so all of the Democrats, except for one, responded. Uh, the Republicans either chose not to or they fell within the categories I mentioned. All of that information is now posted on our website, and I have a couple of cards uh, in my in boxes over there, and my materials over there. The It's All About Kids website, and that information also will be posted on our website as well. So you can go and find out where these candidates stand on some of these issues. You had a question? Uh, yeah, I want to know which um, Democrat candidate didn't answer. Uh, it was Dennis Kucinich, and okay. I think mm -hmm. my speculation is he just didn't have the resources to do it. He doesn't have a lot of money. So I don't know what happened, whether it fell through the cracks. And he's, he doesn't have a, he doesn't have an Iowa office where you can go and say, you're going to fill out the survey and try to get an answer, yes or no. Um, and uh, I, I, my speculation was it fell through the cracks and he's limited staff and resources he has. But uh, that's my only, that's only a speculation. I he did participate in the old 304 cycle. Emily, Emily, um, I, I, I wanted to know why do you think that none of the well, you know, someone asked me that question earlier at, at the meeting down in Des Moines, and I said, really, I think it's a, a but for the two that answered we don't do it. That was the uh, uh, Rudy Giuliani. Uh, and we generally don't do it. That was Mitt Romney. All the others just never really responded in spite of the overtures uh, that were made to them. So in many ways, I'd almost turn the question around. You probably need to ask them uh, and uh, talk to their staff. But in any event, Due diligence was engaged in, and uh, an effort was made to, to do this, and uh, this information is there. Now, it, 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 it's on the websites, and what we're trying to do is encourage people to use it as a tool to find out where the candidate stands on, the, on, the, on any, any, number, any number of these issues so that you can make a determination in terms of what your presidential preference is going to be. So that's an important piece of our work. And the other thing that we're doing is, as I say, we're talking to groups and you know, trying to give them some sense of how the caucus process works. I think uh, with the change in the date from uh, the 14th to the 3rd, I think a lot of undergraduate students, um, whether you're at Iowa State or University of Iowa or a place like Grinnell or some of these other small schools uh, here in Iowa, a great network of small liberal arts colleges, um, um, unless you uh, are registered to vote in your hometown, then you will have an opportunity, you know, to you know to participate in the caucus process. But if you're, uh, I think some people, and I'm, I'm, this is my own speculation. I think some people may be uh, disenfranchised a little bit unintentionally as a result of this change in date. But frankly, I think a lot of adults are going to be disenfranchised because I've talked to adults who are on either side of the political aisle. They just won't be here uh, on. Thursday, January 3rd. So it's going to be interesting to see how this calendar shift, because of all of these accelerated dates, is going to impact on the turnout. It's estimated, I estimate, based upon previous guesstimates uh, and track record, the Democratic caucus somewhere between 125 and maybe 130,000. Um, the Republican caucus, maybe somewhere between 90 and a uh, hundred thousand people will show up, and uh, so th there may be a, a dampening down of the sheer attendance at, at some of these caucuses as a result of these changes. If we're re if we're registered here in Ames, but we will be home, can we re-register the night of the caucus at, in our hometown? Yes, you should. So we, even even if we are registered here, we can still you can re-register there. You, you the can, night of they should fill out those forms, but if you're there. Um, you might want to check with the local party officials, but it's my understanding that anyone who is a resident of the precinct that they, they live in uh, and that they are going to be uh, either 18 as of November 3rd, 2008, uh, they can register, that there will be opportunities to register uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the caucus site, which could include change of uh, residency, even change the party.
How many of you are going to participate in a caucus? Oh, that's a pretty good number. The, the reason that you, those of you who are not, is, is it because you're not old enough, or you're, you're disinterested, or? It's what? Out of town. You're going to be out of town? Where are you going to be? Yeah, you are out of town. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. My daughter went to school out here in Iowa. And she was able to caucus here because of the, 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 the that change in dates and accelerated dates and impact on her. So you're, you're going to be disenfranchised in, in a manner of speaking, meaning in the midst of all this. Other reasons, same thing, out of town? Yeah, OK. Uh, oh, OK, well, that's too bad. But. Uh, um, um, <coughs> How can we get your website out to folks? Well, that's a good question. Um, I was just talking to someone about that today. Uh, we uh, we uh, certainly are actively promoting it. We are going to be running uh, some display ads in some of the uh, larger newspapers uh, in Iowa. We, uh, we have a little banner ad on the uh, Des Moines Register website on their caucus page where it says Iowa Votes for Kids. And if you just click on the ad, you can get to the website. You can Google it. Uh, if you do a Google search for Every Child Matters, uh, we're about the fourth one down. There's an Every Child Matters organization that operates through the government of the United Kingdom. Uh, and that usually is the first one that appears in a Google search. Uh, but, you know, I'm an analog man in this digital world, and I've found that if I take any word or two or a combination of words or two, I can Google it, and about 98% of the time, I find out what I'm looking for. So, uh, I don't know how often you folks use search engines or what your favorite search engines are, but uh, I've found that they're reasonably effective, and uh, Google is, is, been, is, 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 I'm just wedded to it. Other than that, <coughs> that's one of the problems that we have, and that's why I'm you know, speaking to groups. We only have a, a budget of about $35,000 for promotional activity in this remaining window to the, to the caucus date. Uh, there are other independent groups out here uh, that are spending millions and gajillions of dollars. I mean, uh, the AMA has got a campaign for insuring the uninsured. I don't know what their budget is, but I see their stuff everywhere. Uh, billboards in Des Moines, I see banner ads in uh, any number of new, uh, newspapers, the Des Moines paper, the New York Times, uh, Ed 08, which is a, an independent uh, third, uh, uh, 501c3 campaign, educational campaign funded by Bill Gates, they're spending $36 million as I understand. I mean, that's $7 million a state uh, in terms of the early states of New Hampshire, Iowa, South Carolina, and so we have a very modest amount of money that we're spending. And I wish I had a simple answer like, just do that, it would be on our website. But really, I find search engines the most helpful. Well, I guess my question was, too, I think there's probably several of us here who have connections with state professional organizations. How do you send me an email out to those or email to What we try to do is, uh, under the rules of our engagement, we try to gather email signatures sessions like this, and uh, actually it would be good if someone had a line piece of paper. When I dashed out of Des Moines, I didn't bring my clipboard with me. That, and exactly. What we do is we ask folks to to, uh, to give us their names and addresses, and then we send them uh, emails routinely. Um, and what we do have on our website, uh, we have a, uh, we use a sort of a Google mechanism where you, we track the candidates. And several people have said that we have one of the best uh, systems in terms of knowing where a candidate is at any given time um, in, in Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, or South Carolina, because we're tracking them fairly routinely. Most people here in Iowa, uh, and that, there's a side of me that says, even in this world of the internet and web pages, and we're hiding in plain sight, we're sort of in the very question you're asking, obviously we're not getting our information out there. So you can't access the teachers in the state of Iowa, the, the listserv accounts out there in the state of 
Um, usually, our experience has been in terms of uh, our rules of engagement. We try to encourage people to give us their email addresses. Um, and uh, there are some things that legally we cannot do. Uh, if they're a union and they have an, uh, um, they were a 501c3, the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission, could come down on us because we're coordinating. So we try to do it the old fashioned way, one at a time. <coughs> Know, one meeting at a time, one person at a time, talking to people and uh, uh, hoping that they'll pick up on it. But it, it is a constant uh, struggle of trying to do outreach and, and get that information out there. And uh, we just need to do more, more of it best we can. And that's why I sort of jumped at this opportunity to come up here and speak uh, with this uh, with this group. So, is there any way? Yes, Jim. Discretion. Okay. Um, I was wondering what you feel is the biggest issue with what you know, you're talking about in this statute. In terms of kids, I mean, we, we try to focus on about four or five topical issues. Um, I guess if, if me, myself personally, um, in terms of Iowa, I think there's a tremendous uh, network that's advocating for early childhood education, and it's, it's becoming... Uh, I think Iowa is, is doing uh, a great job. Um, some people will have differences of opinions, but moving the whole question of pre-K and early childhood education to the top of the list as a, as a public policy issue. The S-CHIP program, Ch Children's Health, which is the state block grant program uh, funded by the federal government to uh, try to ensure kids who are not insured uh, is, is got some lift and momentum behind it. Senator Grassley, uh, ranking member of the Senate Finance Committee, Committee of Jurisdiction, is working very hard and even battling within his own party and his own party leadership uh, on that program. I think the program that, that strikes me is uh, the one that uh, I probably have the biggest spot for in my heart is kids who are abused and neglected. Because Kids don't choose their parents. Um, it would probably be a different world if that metaphysical phenomenon could occur, but as an abstraction, it's interesting to talk about that kids don't choose their parents. And when you think about how many cases of confirmed child abuse and neglect there are in the country, and how many kids are in the, the child welfare system that, that, that are in foster care, it's 500,000 nationally. That's the, that's the size of the state population of Wyoming. That's how many kids are in, in the child welfare system. So they don't really have a, a strong uh, constituency uh, in terms of uh, an alumni society. They, they have to sort of, um, so that's the group that really that I have my, my, and kids who are parents of uh, 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 meth incarcerated folks who aren't getting, parents aren't getting treatment. Those kids are in, you know, in a limbo as well. So those are the kids that I think that are really in the distant shadow uh, of, of the public policy maker that have paid lip service to them. So those are, those, 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 those kids are the ones that really uh, I have the biggest spot for in my, in my heart uh, in terms of, of, of uh, where they are and who's advocating for them. And just uh, uh, when you think about it, 500,000 kids lost a lot of kids um, that are in that system, and they're in sort of a legal limbo until uh, until their 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 legal ties are terminated from their parents, and someone adopts them. Uh, so that's those, that's one area that really uh, tears at my heartstrings, pulls at my heartstrings. Um, caucus process. Um, questions about part of the part of the deal right now is we're down to about 37, 36 days as of tomorrow in terms of in, engaging candidates. How many of you actually met presidential candidates? Show of hands. Okay. And what kind of questions are, are you are you listening? Are you taking advantage of these opportunities? Are you promoting a particular issue, or are you just uh, what kind of out back there? You raised your hand. What kind of interaction do you have with them? I've just been to a couple. 
So you're observing, listening, evaluating. Yeah, yeah. So you don't. Does anyone actually engage them in an issue? Uh, have any of you? See, this is where one of the things that we're trying to do with people is to say, if you're, you folks are interested in early childhood education, actually going up to them and say, I'm a student, you know, in early childhood education. As president, what will you do to improve uh, the, the opportunities, not only for me as a teacher, but for kids in, in the area of early childhood education? You'd be surprised at the answers you get. I mean, they, they, they probably have them sort of programmed into their head. But that's one of the things that I think is that this, this process, this quadrennial exercise, the Iowa caucus process, really give you is an opportunity to have face time with a presidential candidate. You've got to talk to them. And my favorite story, really, um, it's almost mythic now, because uh, I've told it so many times, and uh, I've actually uh, met the, the person uh, who's behind the story. She's a Head Start mother. In the 1996 presidential election, uh, Bob Dole was seeking a, the nomination of the Republican Party, ultimately got it. This Head Start mother was working a rope line. Uh, she was on a rope line, and the, the presidential candidate, Senator Dole, was coming down the rope line. Uh, she, uh, and he, what they do on these rope lines is basically, you know, they, they touch hands, shake hands, and maybe two or three words exchange. She actually shook the senator's hand, started talking about Head Start reauthorization bill, which was some aspect of the Head Start program that was pending in Washington at the time. Wouldn't let his hand go until he answered the question. And of course, you know, there are other people who want to touch the candidate's hand. So one of the things that we're trying to do is go beyond just sort of listening and observing, is take some of the information that's contained here or some of the information that you have that you're learning as students in the area of early childhood education or if you're in family studies, if you're into substance abuse and you know that the issue of substance abuse is, is really hurting families and creating high levels of incarceration and it's a reflection of a failed social policy, challenge these people. Talk to them. Uh, you can do it in a very conversational way and have a very interesting conversation with them. And what we've found basically is it begins to move. It begins to move things. My favorite story from the 0304 cycle was uh, a former governor from North Carolina <coughs> came uh, to, he, uh, he was going to be in Cedar Rapids in, uh, on a Friday and he was going to be in Des Moines on a, on a Saturday morning. I was working with a group of people in early childhood education. And uh, we all welcomed the opportunity to meet with what they call a surrogate. This is a person who comes in, uh, talks about the particular candidate he's supporting. It's North Carolina, so you can probably guess who the candidate is. Governor Hunt is a great guy. <coughs> he was a three-term governor in North Carolina. They weren't sequential terms. His, his delightful wife is from Mingo, Iowa. And this is a Saturday morning back in October of 03. We're at the Hotel Fort Des Moines. And I'm sitting right beside him. And he's earnestly talking about early childhood development. He could have lectured on the subject. He was that good. I mean, you know, the brain and early development and all the synapses and how everything works. And, and it was just great. I mean, it was a, he, he was doing a great job. And then he sort of comes and says, now I want to talk about my, my candidate who I'm campaigning for in, in Iowa. And his position on early childhood education. Well, there are several people who are very knowledgeable about early childhood education here in Iowa. They they had Senator then Senator Edwards' book, you know, everything that he was going to do if he was elected president. They said, well, there's nothing in this book on early childhood education. It was one of those kind of moments that um, here's a guy who comes in for a candidate talking about a particular topic, and the people that they're pitching they respond by saying he has nothing in his book on early childhood education. Of course, there were some staff people down on the other end of the room saying, well, we're working on it, we're working on it. So about two or three weeks later, as it happened, he was up in Fort Dodge, Iowa, this, uh, this candidate, uh, Senator Edwards, and he was outlining, he was having a big press conference, outlining his uh, positions on early childhood education, and they were very well received. So, candidate was moved by this movement. You know, you would ask me about the issues that are 
you know, some of them have serious political momentum as we speak right now. Early childhood education in Iowa is one of them. There, there are some a lot of tweaking that has to go on, but there's there's been some movement. Uh, well, but the, but the side effect was that there was another candidate. He said, "Well, I'm big on early childhood education." So he had to have a press conference, and he brought in uh, Rob Reiner uh, from California, who is a big advocate of early childhood education in the West Coast, and he was at the Governor Dean's press conference at the, the Des Moines Area Community College uh, down here in uh, Ames, uh, not Ames, but in Aiken. Uh, so there was kind of a cascade effect. So one of the things that we try to do is sort of to get people to feel comfortable talking to candidates, and uh, you know what you should do is to get into the exercise of you know you can you can try to go in and you know, these guys are pretty smart. I mean they really are smart. I don't care where, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. These people who run for high political office, they really are. They're pretty smart. I acknowledge that they're pretty smart. So what you have to do, I think, in terms of you're going to meet with one of these presidential candidates and you have a particular question that you're going to ask them, I think you need to don't get up on a soapbox and sort of go on for five minutes and try to outside everybody in the room. I think you should frame your question in terms of a technique. You should frame your question in about 20 or 30 seconds. You know, I'm Tom LaPointe. Uh, I'm a caucus fellow. I'm interested in children who are abused and neglected in the child welfare system. So, I know there are 500,000 kids in that system. So, I've, I've stated, I've introduced myself in the first part of the question. I've stated what I'm interested in in the middle of the question. And I've. You know, have this man your voice, and this is how I feel, this is where I stand. Or is it more than, you know, since we are in this technological world, is it better to just do it online? Or do you own personal? Well, it is. Stephanie was there and he saw the t-shirt and you know we pointed to the blue sign saying well, we're going to have this session here. I think that registered with him. But I don't, I, I don't. So um, there was another time recently I was up in uh, the Cora and uh, Senator, actually Senator Edwards was having an event up there at a little hotel, Fort Bloomshire Hotel in downtown the Cora. And well I didn't go into the event but I said Oh, is this, I said to someone, I saw three vans lined up. And I said, three vans. Edwards is in the building. The lead car is his car. The other one for the press and the staff and anyone else that's in that small area. So and I said to them, is Senator Edwards going to be coming out that door, which was kind of right at the end of the road right here? And the van was right here. And they said, yeah, he's going to come out that door. And I put two and two together. I'm going to stand right here. I'm going to talk to Senator Edwards. So I sort of did this kind of strategic position. I uh, didn't have an opportunity to go to a microphone. So he came up. I had an Every Charm Adish uh, uh, shirt on. And I said, um, Senator Edwards, I appreciate all the work that you're doing on behalf of kids and Every Child Matters. Um, he participated in one of our forums up in New Hampshire, in Oak Tree Oak Four. Uh, his wife was there, and she came over. And shook their hand and I said, Mrs. Edwards, uh, in o October of 03, you said you had an unvoting for kids a bumper sticker from our organization on your pickup truck in North Carolina. And she says, I still have it. So I was trying to make an impression, you know, in a, in a very sort of uh, dynamic political environment. But what I did is, uh, I, I wasn't just going to stand by and, and, and let the opportunity pass. I wanted to, you know, talk to them. And the other way you can do it, of course, is if you're at an event, um, and you can do this with a teacher, you can do this you know, with a posse of people who are interested in early childhood education, you can go up and you know, 
have uh, information on how the caucus process works uh, and uh, resolutions. You should go to your caucus and introduce a resolution. I think that that, we spent a lot of time uh, earlier tonight and uh, Des Moines talking about the resolution process. I was in with these rather seasoned, old time retired social workers um, and we really got into it, re really got into the weeds of you know, the, the, the resolution process. And uh, we have on our website, our caucus kit, we have um, a very tightly worded sentence that you could introduce as a resolution when you go to the Iowa caucus. This sort of bubbles up to the top and becomes part of the PAGI platform. The same aforementioned Head Start mother from 96, she is, a, she is an important part of the Democratic Party platform committee now. She makes sure that all of these things get introduced and, and, and uh, incorporated into the party platform. Um, and, and then she's able to go to local legislators or when she's at the state house dealing with members of her party who say, well, I can't vote for this. Hey, hey, it's right here on the party platform. <coughs> this is, you know, this is an important state. So you can do those kinds of things. Um, um, you can do some things on your own by just going into the various candidates, for the, for their offices. How many, how many candidates have offices here in Kansas? Have you been there? To, you can go in and ask questions. Um, I mean, again, this is the old-fashioned shoe leather way. You can go in and say, I'd like to see uh, you know, the, can her, uh, the, the candidate's uh, position paper on, uh, on early childhood education. That's your, I mean, I would, if I were you guys, I would just focus on early childhood education. That's your bread and butter. You know that probably better than I do. Um, you got a little posse here, five of you, you could, uh, you could all go in uh, one at a time or together and say that uh, we want information on early childhood education. You can go to the website uh, and, and start framing questions around that. You can use the old fashioned way, you can use the technological way to get these candidates' attention. You can do both. Pardon? You can do both. Yeah, yes, I mean, you, both. you guys probably are very capable of using both. Um, I'm so Well, before you go there, let me just say you're lucky because in 1965, I was I was in the military and I couldn't vote. And um, I got I got injured and I uh, served a very undistinguished career in the Carolina campaign. And I went home. Uh, the first time I could vote was really in 1966, and I I, I registered. I, I I delighted in the fact that I was able to vote in the primary. I had little or no idea who the hell I was voting for when I got down ballot in terms of some of the legislative candidates. But, you know, uh, I did it. Um, and then I found myself, six years later, running for the legislature. So, um, uh, relish the opportunity that you have to vote, because um, I didn't have it. And, and that's kind of where my question is going from. I know a lot of my friends that I've talked to, you know, they, they don't have any I can encourage people to caucus. I know this is a huge question. I have two ways of answering that question. One, one is you can encourage them, you know, until the sun goes down uh, and the sun comes up in the morning. Uh, you just, or you can just say, you know something? That means I have more power. You know, there was this old Republican consultant in Maine. He, he used to relish the idea and, and, and speak to the idea that he didn't care about people who didn't vote because it gave him more power because he did engage in the process. So it's kind of a cynical way of looking at it, but the upbeat, the upside of it was, well, you know, you're participating, you have more power, and you can shape policy um, if, you, if you take all the tools that are available, particularly with the technology that's available today. So I don't, I, I, I have really mixed feelings about that. I mean, I certainly encourage people to register to vote. Uh, and I was delighted when I had a chance to do it. But if, if, if they don't want to do it, then you have more power yourself because you are participating. You've just increased your impact maybe by two or three more by virtue of their not participating. Kind of a cynical way of looking at it. I'm sure that if Ben Franklin were here, he might agree with me, but some of the others, like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, John Adams, and all those people who wrote the federal papers might not agree with me, but I like to Ben Franklin.
Franklin's attitude, and I'm sure he probably would buy me with what I'm saying, is that you should, there's more power to you. To heck with it. So, anything, uh, question back there, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, you said 8.7 million kids without health care. Do you know anything more specifically about what the makeup of that is, like demographics, or that just sounds like a high number considering Medicaid and that shit, so that's especially unfortunate, I think, even though I was just wondering. Yeah, that almost would require uh, an hour-long lecture. I mean, what I think is happening with the S-CHIP program in Iowa probably other states. Uh, our country, the United States, if you look at the evolution of healthcare policy, it became an employee uh, uh, benefit and uh, that, that sort of evolved, my, my limited knowledge of the history of, of it sort of evolved post-World War II. A lot of the other industrialized countries went with uh, government uh, programs. Uh, so their level of uninsured is, is really down. And employers were offering that as a benefit, but I, I almost think that the whole employee-driven health insurance benefit program is on is is on the is on the down. Uh, someone shared an anecdote with me the other a couple of months ago, which was that both parents worked and they were covered through. Uh, uh, their employer through um, uh, Wellmark. But they didn't have enough money, nor did they have an employee benefit that covered their kids. So their kids were enrolled in the S-CHIP program. And I thought that was a very interesting uh, <coughs> scenario in that if you have, if you're employed and uh, you get health insurance, Maybe your spouse doesn't, so you pay for that, so they're on that package. But the kids don't have health insurance, and they enroll in the S-CHIP program, which is not a Medicaid program. It's really a, the way it's run here in, in Iowa is that you enroll in the program, and you actually get a, uh, I think there's, you get a Wellmark card, or there's another insurance company card that you get. And you don't feel as though you're on Medicaid because you have a health insurance card through Wellmark. And that's a whole culture of poverty and how people don't want to be on welfare kind of thing. But um, I think the, the large, I think the part of the issue there, and I'm just scratching at the surface, is the whole employee health insurance program. When, when you see the big, uh, one of the General Motors saying that every time you buy a GM car, embedded in the cost of that car is a health insurance benefit for a retiree. Um, that's, and, and they want, they either want the federal government to bail them out of that particular program through some sort of mechanism, either political or going through bankruptcy, or as they recently worked out with the United Auto Workers, they sold, uh, they tricked, they, they engaged in some sort of swap and uh, you, you, the United Auto Workers are is picking up the program for the retirees and they're going to try to run it. But what I see, my sense is happening is the demise of the employee assisted uh, insurance through your, your employer. Now with public agencies or institutions like Iowa State University or state employees, it's, that's a different story. They negotiate those benefits, I think the part of collective bargaining, but so um, read hard numbers on that or Pardon me? I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, just... It's mostly anecdotal. I don't think okay. anyone's really scratched okay. the surface on that. Um, um, I've, I've talked to Charlie Bruner about it. I've shared this anecdote with him. And uh, I, I, think he, I think he was, he, I could see some wheels beginning to turn in his head uh, in terms of the expression on his face. I mean, he's a PhD, he's a pretty bright guy. Uh, but runs this group down in the Child and Family Policy Center down in Des Moines, lives here in Story County. Um, um, my sense is that that's what's going on. And uh, I, I, think, I don't think we've had the real public policy debate on how we should go with this. 
because the insurance lobby is very big. I mean, I learned that a long time ago when I was in the Maine legislature. And the drug lobby is very big. I mean, they spend gazillions of dollars. I mean, the amounts of money that they spend is enormous. And uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know how that debate is going to unfold in terms of public policy. It, it always seems to become very topical in, in a in an election year. But when you, as someone once said that. <clears throat> we want to have all these people at the table. Um, some wag told me the other day, yeah, all these people are at the table, the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical. But what they do at the table is they eat our lunch. You know, you know, in a, sort of a political metaphor. Um, and that's what happened uh, with uh, Hillary Care back in 92. They just, the insurance companies just turned on their PR machine and it, it went down in flames. What do you think of this AMA uh, voice for the uninsured? Do you think that they're... You know, I've seen their banner ads and everything, and I talked to a... I, I was up here at the Ames Straw Poll, and I got a brochure from the guy, and, and, and I looked at it, and I said, I don't think there's anything there. I, 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 but I haven't really looked at it seriously. Because they've been... But they're dropping a lot of money. ...against the Hillary Care thing, and even, I mean, past efforts for... They've been against any sort of, like, Medicare for All type thing, but it's interesting see them doing all of a sudden. That, that just that surprises me all the way. Well, it's in politics, I think it could be a, what I would call a prophylactic move on their part. I mean, they're just trying to prevent something from happening. They want to be, they want to make sure they're going to be at the table where they probably will eat our lunch again. I mean, I, I just have, I mean, I just, my personal view is on my little coffee break in the middle of my lectures, I mean, I would just like to see us come up with a system where everyone has access to health care. Yes. But I think to get everyone to come to some kind of compromise on that. To be honest with you, I thought that Romney, with his approach in, in Massachusetts, came pretty close. Um, but I think there was a unique demographic that created uh, the political alignment for that to happen. I don't think that you have the similar sort of situation you have here in, in other 49 states. That might be a kind of a unique situation. Isn't he against that? I thought I heard he's, he's against his Massachusetts plan on the national level. Um, he, he seems to have uh, acceded to a position where every state should come up with their own solution, which, okay, if we want to have 49 or uh, 50 different uh, health insurance uh, templates that we're going to work with that involve the, the well marks and the private insurance industry and Medicaid and Medicare, and S-CHIP, and everything else, then I think that's happening here in Iowa with Senator Hatch. Uh, and he's trying to, you know, bring all these pieces together, but uh, it will be interesting to see how it plays out. So I think that, I mean, I'm, I'm not, uh, my sense is that while he seems to be backing away from it, uh, there, there seems to be an appearance that he's backing away from it. I think the spin that he's putting on it, and I think there's some sense to this, from his point of view, I don't, uh, I don't necessarily agree with it. Is that every state probably should come up with their own solution to the problem? Because when you when you look at the amount of money between the publics and the private, oh, yeah. there's a lot of dough going into health insurance. No question about it. Oh, sorry, that's a little off topic, but the Massachusetts plan was just basically like wasn't it just forcing everybody to have some sort of coverage and uh, was some state. Yeah, you know, that's what in a nutshell, yeah. That's what I yeah, and then there would be a subsidy yeah. of some sort uh, that would be brought into play. But it's a real tough nut to crack because uh, I've been in the middle of some of those fights uh, in terms of dealing with hospitals and insurance companies. And it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting dynamic, and it's always playing out in many different ways. But we're sort of off the caucus process, but I mean, I think that I think what your question really points to is, even though healthcare and insuring the uninsured is one of the top three issues, it's really going to be a tough nut to crack in terms of getting it done. You know, and I, to some extent, I kind of like what I love uh, Edwards's populist approach on this. I mean, I've seen his ad, and I've always thought, why don't we? Why doesn't everyone have the same insurance policy that the members of the United States Congress have? You know, it's good enough for them. It should be good enough for everybody. Can he really do? It? I mean, I watched that commercial today. It's you think, great, you know, cancel theirs if we can't have ours. But can he really do that? I remember seeing some email. I'm not a lawyer, but I suspect no. 
I was say, I was like, because we'd have to deal with, I mean, there is a thing called the equal branches of government. And they, they, <laughs> yeah, but, I think I got one of these like fact check emails saying no, but I mean, if you wanted to like veto the federal budget or something like that, depending on how drastic he was willing to, it, sort of measure he was willing to take, but I, I, I think it's I a, doubt that would be easy. It's a very strong statement. I think it, it makes the point, but I think the short answer is probably not. But the big point is that he's Sometimes you have to do something outrageous to get everyone's attention. And I think he's done that with that. Um, well, uh, hopefully you've, you've, we've had some discussion of all the tools that you can use. Pick up some of our materials. And we have t-shirts here if someone wants to. I can if you guys are interested. If you want to get on our email list, I think, Stephanie, you have something to. Oh, yeah. Um, what do you need on email? Name, 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 name,